And I get talking to the superintendent there. And I told him about my conversation with Mr. Shedd. He said, well, the regional office is down in Richmond. Why don't you go in and see if they got any vacancies? So about a month later, I went down there and met the, the uh, chief historian for the southeast region of the United States, in which most of the Civil War areas are located, and the chief of interpretation for the region. They interviewed me, and I said, do you, uh, do you have any vacancies? And he said, yes. We will have one at Vicksburg, Mississippi. And, uh, but it's encumbered, but it's vacant now. When he said, and you have, and he said, do you have civil service status? Yes. Uh, what degrees do you have? I stated them to them. And they said, well, since we have a vacancy at Vicksburg, we can get you, we'll, if you're interested, we'll, you can take the position on the understanding that the, per, the incumbent, it's during the Korean War, and the incumbent had gone back into the service. And of course, if you have civil service status and have gone into the service, you have <clears throat> dibs on that job if you want it when you get out. So since I was a bachelor and could move in my car, I said, that's good. So I was hired as a uh, park historian at the Pittsburgh National Memory Park. After about a year, uh, Captain Adams, as he was in the Air Force, informed the uh, National Park Service he wasn't coming back. He was going to pursue his career in the military. So that's how I got the position permanently. So that's how I became a Park Service historian to start with. And the rest is history. <laughs> <laughs> and that's, so that's where it's all started. That's where 40, 40 years and eight months began. Is there any particular area of the Civil War that you consider your expertise? <laughs> well, quite frankly, I worked three years at Vicksburg National Building Park. And then I became a research historian for the, for the Southeast region of the National Park Service, headquartered in Richmond which is ideal because all that embraces all the states of the old Confederacy, except the state of Texas. Hmm. Uh, does not involve either <coughs> Antietam or Gettysburg, but all the rest of the National Park Service areas at that time were in the Southeast region. So with the Civil War Centennial, Congress at that time had established a national committee on the Centennial of the Civil War. They have not this time, and it's highly doubtful if they do. Uh, that they will. So, uh, and the Park Service was on a program of itself which was known as Mission 66. Now the Park Service uh, came into being in August 1916. To be in charge, uh, the National Park Service was created to be the steward of areas of natural parks like Yellowstone, uh, the historic sites, the archaeological sites. And the Park Service had done well during the first Great Depression because they had the CCC program and emergency conservation. <clears throat> and by 1942, the parks infrastructure was considered uh, at an optimum stage because they got a lot more for their buck with the emergency conservation program 
and the CCC than you'll ever get from stimulus. And you, I'm talking big money then was $5 billion. Uh, they wouldn't have known what you're talking about with a trillion dollars. But with the advent of World War II, followed three, year, three and a half years by the Korean conflict, the Park Service did not fare well in appropriations. So by 1955, the parks, which had been of a high standard as to their infrastructure, and the, par and the people now have a five-day week, and people like to travel. So visitation was booming in the Park Service, but the infrastructure of the Park Service had not kept pace. So Conrad Worth, the then director of the Park Service, was able to sell it to the Eisenhower administration, what became known as the Mission 66 program, to bring the, to get, get become a presidential priority just like Eisenhower's highways are. And to make the Park Service again bring it up to standards by its 50th anniversary, which would be August 1966. So having the Civil War centennial from 61, 65 provided for it's a way to tie the Park Service's development program which is a presidential initiative into the Park Service's Mission 66. So I became a research historian for the Civil War Parks for the Mission 66 program. So that expanded my knowledge of the big Park Service Civil War Parks from Vicksburg National Military Park to the other parks in the Park Service that primarily focus on the Civil War. In fact, I was even lent to Antietam uh, so it could get ready for a Mission 66 program. At that time, Antietam was a rather low-key park. The visitor center that you have at that park is a Mission 66 park mm -hmm. visitor center, where they blended the Civil War Centennial and the Mission 66. The, the, the road network, as you see it, the road that goes up to uh, the overlook at Burnside Bridge, the bypass of uh, the Sunken Road, those are all Mission 66. So much of what you see in the Antietam National Battlefield is owed, the infrastructure is a result of the Civil War Centennial marriage with the Mission 66 program, the National Park System. Well, because this year is the 150th, I was telling you, or the sesquicentennial, I think yes. they call it, we're doing a special insert in our newspaper, doing a number of stories throughout these five years that are coming up. Yes. And one of the stories that I'm working on is a story that really focuses on the day it all changed, April 12th. 1861. Which one? April 12th, Fort Sumter. Yes. The day it all changed. Yes. And I wanted to talk to you about that day a little bit and get some of your expert information on it, particularly for this area. Well, they, the, the, there are other first shots in the Civil War, but the, the shot that counts is a shot that was fired at Fort Sumter at 4.30 a.m. 
on the morning of the 12th day of April. Because uh, they've been talking up to that time. The Confederates, they at that time, seven Confederate states, seven southern states had left the Union and had formed the provisional and had formed the Confederate States of America. In the first two weeks of February, meeting in Montgomery, Alabama, they had elected a president and a vice president, provisional. They had formulated a constitution, and the framers of that constitution had also become the first Confederate Congress until they can elect one. As so Lincoln, when he is inaugurated on the fourth day of, of uh, March, will give an inaugural address in which you will use, present both the carrot and the stick. The Buchanan administration had Donald as the seven states had seceded from the Union. The seven states on leaving the Union had seized the federal properties, most of the federal properties in their states. And uh, organizing an army, the government. So Lincoln, when he is inaugurated, as the president will make, he will, uh, he will, uh, uh, he will, uh, he will uh, t uh, t tell them that uh, he will not be the aggressor. If, if someone becomes this aggressor, they will become the aggressors. He then will reach back to those mystic chords of history, leading back to the Revolutionary War and hope that the better angels will appeal. So Lincoln, and he's also has pledged to repossess the federal property that has been seized by the states. Now the most important one, symbolically, is Fort Sumter in Charleston Harbor. When South Carolina withdrew from the Union on the 20th day of December, there is in Charleston Harbor about 90 United States troops posted in Fort Moultrie on Sullivan's Island. Sullivan's Island is indefens is not defensible. So on the night of the 26th day of December, Major Robert Anderson, whose father had helped defend Sullivan's Island against the British in 1780, where he was captured, married to a Kentuckian, married to a Georgian whose family owned slaves, will move the garrison from Fort Moultrie on Sullivan's Island, which he sees as indefensible 
to Fort Sumter in the harbor, an island. Now there are other forts in the south that are still in United States possession. There is in Florida Key West, Fort Taylor, Fort Jefferson, Andrade Tortugas, but they're isolated. But there is another fort in the south that is not isolated, held by a small United States garrison, Fort Pickens. But Pickens is not symbolic. Fort Sumter is symbolic to both sides. Lincoln was going to find that he has a real problem on the fifth day of, Mar of March. Because there's a letter coming in to the War Department from Major Anderson that says that with, within a short time, He'll be out of supplies and will have to evacuate Fort Sumter. If Fort Sumter is to be reinforced, he believes it will take 20,000 men. Now initially the Lincoln cabinet is going to divide over this. Now meanwhile, the Confederates government is now responsible for the defense of the Confederacy. Up until the formation of the Confederate government is a quarrel between the independent nation of South Carolina and the United States. Now an opposition man in South Carolina who opposed secession, Judge Pettigrew will describe South Carolina as a strange place. Too small for a nation, too large for an insane asylum. <laughs> so a crisis is going to develop over Fort Sumter. Can it be reinforced? And if the United States tries to reinforce it, will the Confederates resist? Toward the end of March, Mr. Lincoln decides, after having sent Gustavus Fox, a brother-in-law of Postmaster General Montgomery Blair down to Charleston that he believes after a meeting with Anderson it might be possible to reinforce Fort Sumter. Meanwhile, Lincoln has problems. Lincoln's problems are that the United States Secretary of State, William Stewart, had been the odds-on favorite to be the Republican nominee, but he lost the nomination. And he is now in Lincoln's cabinet as the Secretary of War. And he believes that Lincoln can't really, isn't really up to dealing with this crisis. And he is working at cross purposes with Lincoln. Because the go Confederate government have sent three men to Washington, headed by soon to be former Justice Camel to negotiate a settlement to the problem of Charleston, to try and get the government, the United States government, to evacuate Sumter. Not talking to Mr. Lincoln, 
Mr. Sub, uh, Mr. Stewart will tell Judge Campbell on the ninth day of March that we're going to evacuate Fort Sumter. Judge Campbell by the 19th is going to ask, when are you going to do it, not evacuate it? He says, any day now. He does not know what the right hand is planning. And the left hand is giving the Confederates what he thinks. He thinks he's running the show. So meanwhile, we finally has to tell Judge Campbell that we're going to evacuate, we're going to reinforce. We're going to throw supplies into Fort Sumter. And if they're fired on, we're going to return fire. So two expeditions fit out. The one under Gustavus Fox will sail from New York on the 6th of April. It will consist of the steamer Baltic. Aboard the Baltic, which is a merchant ship chartered, will be several hundred soldiers below deck. The Baltic when it sails will be accompanied by three tugs. And to rendezvous with it off Fort Sumter will be the revenue cutter Harriet Lane, armed a powerful sloop of war Powhatan. Powhatan you're going to find out has been ordered to Fort Pickett by Secretary Stewart. And two other warships, Pocahontas and Pawnee. Now, Anderson has been notified the expedition is coming. He knows that if he's not reinforced or resupplied by the 15th, he'll have to evacuate. On the 9th, it's now in the Confederate government's hands. Lincoln has notified the governor of South Carolina that he is sending an expedition to reinforce and resupply Fort Sumter. And he trusts it will not be fired upon. Pickens notifies President Davis. President Davis has a cabinet meeting on the night. It's a long one. In the period since the first day of March when, when former Major Beauregard of the United States Army has arrived, now a Brigadier General of Confederate Army is in charge. And he has erected almost 40 guns that can register on Fort Pickens, on, on Fort Sumter. So, at the end of the day, the Confederate cabinet, consisting of six, will vote five to one that we will notify General Beauregard to call upon Major Anderson for the evacuation of Fort Sumter. <clears throat> and 
And if he refuses, it's going to be fired upon. Now the only person that opposes it is, a, is, is Bob Toombs. He's loud, obnoxious. But he's the, he's the only one that predicts it. He says, if you fire on Fort Sumter, it will start a civil war like there's never been a civil war before. So one of the Confederate, one of the six, calls what's going to happen. So on the 10th, Beauregard receives the message. Now Beauregard is going to send three men out to meet with Anderson to find out what his actions going to be if the Union try to reinforce and supply Sumter. They consist of Major Chestnut, the famed Dyrus husband, former senator from South Carolina. Major Chisholm, one of Beauregard's staff. Now, uh, and Captain S.D. Lee. So they're going out on the 10th. and party. They will meet with Anderson. And Anderson will, uh, this is on the 11th, they will meet with Anderson. And in the discussions, Anderson will uh, say, uh, he's been ordered to defend the place he will not give a satisfactory answer that he'll, he's prepared to evacuate. But as a return, Anderson and Chestnut hang back. And Anderson tells Chestnut, if I'm not reinforced or supplied by the 20th, by the 615th, I will surrender. My supplies are out. A window of opportunity. So the three men go back and meet with Borgard. Borgard decides that if Anderson will surrender, by the 15th, he will be allowed to march out with the honors of war. On the night of the 11th, a few minutes before midnight, a boat puts out. Now aboard the boat is in addition to Chisholm, Chestnut, Lee, is Roger Pryor, a troublemaker from Virginia a former congressman, who will tell the South Carolinians that within 24 hours, by the Shrewsbury clock, of the exchange of fire at Sumter, Virginia will join you.
<clears throat> now the important thing at this moment, there are seven states in the Confederacy. There are eight states that are not slave states. There's Virginia, the large, the, the most populous slave state, not the largest, Texas is, but the most populous. North Carolina, Tennessee, and Arkansas, plus Missouri, Kentucky, Maryland, and Delaware. So out they go. And again, Anderson will say, if I am not supplied by the 15th, I will evacuate. Surrender, I'll evacuate Fort Shores. The Confederates do not consider it. They're authorized to agree to that. So, on the way back, the boat pulls over to James Island. On James Island are two batteries, each of them mounting two 10-inch siege mortars. James Island is about 4,000 yards from Sumter. They land. They go over to the battery. The man in charge is Captain John James, who will die at the Battle of South Mountain on the 14th day of September, 62. They inform him Anderson's reply was unsatisfactory. James gives Roger Pryor, that troublemaker from Virginia, the honor of pulling the lanyard after the 10-inch mortar has been loaded and primed. He declined. Then he turns to Lieutenant Farley. He says, fire the gun. So, at 4.30 a.m. in the morning, in the dark, the crowds have assembled on the battery. Mrs. Chestnut says, never have you seen the menace witty and gallant as they are. And as they watch, you can see the ball ascending, the fuse kicking off a trail of sparks. Reaching its apogee, and it falls and explodes above Fort Sumter. The shot has been fired. Within a short time, Confederates in the floating battery anchored off Cummings Point, 1,200 yards, open fire. Firing one of the first shots from it is another old troublemaker from Virginia, Edmund Ruffin, 68 years old, 
who will be the only one that loves the Confederacy enough to commit suicide when they go down the drain. You'll shoot him, you'll blow his brains out in June of 1865. I thought he fired the first shot. The guns at Fort Moultrie opened fire, as well as a floating battery. There will be no reply from Fort Sumter. Now Fort Sumter has about has about 25 guns on the barbed tier, pointing towards Sumter. There will be the guns fixed in mortar fashion on the on the parade, and the rest of the guns that will reply are in the first tier piece, uh, casements. Well, the garrison consisting of the nine members of the band, excuse me, seven members of the band, the nine officers, and the 68 enlisted men. We'll eat about five, about six o'clock. They'll then go to their positions. And at about 7.20, Captain Abner Doubleday, who according 